Thank you so much for coming. I know there's a lot of great content at this event you could be listening to, so I appreciate you coming to listen to me. Um, I've been doing open source for several years, and I'm here because people uh, took the opportunity to mentor me and teach me how to do things, and I'm hoping to, to share some of these uh, practical tips with you. Um, there's been some content already in the event about various tools you can use and uh, you know, people that have done research on this. These are my observations over the last 20 years. Uh, I've been largely making it up as I go along, but I have been doing it for a while, so hopefully some of this is not far off the mark. Um, something that I've observed over the years is that people have many different reasons for getting involved in open source software. And often the first one of these is, is to solve problems, to solve your own problems, to work on something that's not working quite the way you anticipated. Um, another reason is that it's a lot of fun. People do it because it's a hobby. People do it because they want to make the world a better place. Uh, one of the reasons that people stay in open source is often the, uh, the possibility of leaving a legacy, uh, leaving something that, that people will remember. And uh, so my, my uh, premise here is that your way to achieve immortality in open source is to mentor people to come behind you. Um, and this is... Uh, this is something that has, that has uh, proven out in my own experience. So I want to start with this photograph here. Well, it's not a photograph, obviously. This painting here. Um, does anyone know who this is? All right, this is a, uh, a famous painting by Titian of Socrates. And in this painting, Socrates is sitting on his bed um, expounding great truths. And in fact, in the picture, he's about to uh, drink some poison and commit suicide. Um, Socrates is fascinating to me because he was the, the original, uh, you know, the, the programmer who thinks that his code should speak for himself. He, uh, he never wrote anything down. He never documented. In fact, he believed that writing stuff down was antithetical to teaching philosophy. And so he never wrote anything down. We, uh, we know what he said because his, uh, his disciples wrote it down. Um, so in particular, Aristotle wrote down most of what he said, and that's, that's how we even know that this guy existed. And so the lesson here is that if you want to be immortal, have disciples that write down everything you say and hang on your every word, right? And that's, that's a great dream. How about this guy? Anybody know who this guy is? I see that, that most of you know that this is Vincent van Gogh, and um, he achieved immortality not by having disciples or even by being a nice person. I, I've been reading a book called Dear Theo, which is a collection of his letters to his brother Theo, and every single letter sounds like, I'm a genius, nobody understands that I'm a genius, please send me more money. And every letter is like that. He's, he's apparently a very unpleasant man. Um, and also, throughout his life, he felt that he wasn't terribly successful because he didn't get the recognition he deserved. Um, but this, this feeling of not being successful, he channeled into uh, hard work, and he created an enormous body of, of work. And um, so now you can go into most major museums in the world, and you'll find at least one picture that he painted because he was so prolific. Um, he, he did, in fact, have one friend that he kind of mentored, and that was Paul Gauguin, um, who's my favorite painter. But primarily, we remember him because he painted so much. So that's lesson two. If you want to be remembered, do a lot of work. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. How about this guy? Anybody know who Ikecrates is? Unless you are a PhD student in philosophy, you've probably never heard of this guy. He um, was one of Aristotle's friends, possibly. Maybe, maybe he was uh, just a co-student. It's, it's really unclear who he was. He's mentioned once in the writings of Aristotle, and he's mentioned as though he was an important character, but we don't know anything about him because he didn't write anything down and didn't have any disciples to write anything down. So 
Now you've heard his name, which puts you above you know, most of the rest of the world. So here's what we learned. If you want to be immortal, you can either leave an extensive body of work or you can leave students who are even more intelligent than yourself. And both of these are, are challenging things to do. Um, let's start with option number one, leave an extensive body of work. One thing that you find, okay, so this is another painting by Titian, and um, it, uh, it is a picture of a guy by the name of Sisyphus. And Sisyphus was punished by the gods. Um, his punishment was to carry a rock up, to, up a hill. And every single time he got to the top of the hill, he would accidentally drop the rock and it would roll to the bottom of the hill. Now, if you read a lot of Greek mythology, you'll notice that the punishment always fits the crime, always, in kind of a, an ironic, cruel way. Sisyphus's crime was uh, being extremely self-important. He was very fond of himself. He, he did all of this magnificent stuff and was always telling somebody about it. But the funny thing about doing hard work is that as soon as you stop, people start to forget you. Um, you know, you can, you can contribute to an to a open source project for years and years, but as soon as you stop, eventually your patches are overwritten by other patches and your effect goes away. And so hard work is just, it's just too much hard work. So I recommend option number two, which is to leave impressive students, to mentor people to come behind you. Um, doing hard work means you actually have to do that hard work. So. Uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Um, I see we don't have any Princess Bride fans here. All right. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Um, because Socrates invested his life in his disciples, um, his, student, his student Plato wrote down a lot of this. I, I got the names wrong a little while back, and, and none of the philosophy students in the audience called me out on it. Plato was, was uh, Socrates' disciple, and one of Plato's disciples was Aristotle. And between the, t the three of these people, they form the basis for what we consider modern philosophy. And uh, each one down the line learned from, uh, from their their instructor, and we see the chain of mentoring. Now, I'll give you one word of caution, and that is be careful who you mentor, because one of Aristotle's mentors was Alexander the Great, who uh, killed much of the world at the time. You know, he swept across the world and destroyed nations, and um, so, you know, be, be careful who you mentor, or they might destroy the world. But uh, here's some, some practical tips about mentoring that, uh, that, that, that I think that you can apply immediately. These don't, these don't take years of practice. These are things that you can apply immediately. The first, and I think the most important thing that you can do as a mentor is to give permission. Now, we have this notion that because it's open source, everybody has permission and they know it. And that is not the case. You need to explicitly give permission for people to feel that they have permission. And this, this may seem unintuitive if you've just been doing this for years, but it is a, a common theme among beginners that they don't feel like they're, it's not, I'm not one of the core developers, I can't do that, I don't really feel like I have the rights to do that. Now, there's two different ways that you can give permission. The first one is simply giving technical permission, giving people right access to the repository, giving people right access to the wiki, to the documentation, to the, the Google Doc where you're developing your marketing presentation. Giving people the technical permission to do the work is the first step here. And you need to make that as easy as possible. Um, if people have to jump through a lot of hoops in order to contribute a change, they're going to go away. Now, I'm, uh, I'm one of the administrators on the Apache Software Foundation Facebook page. And we got a, a message from some user, some Cassandra user, a couple days ago, 
that said, hey, you have a typo on the front page of your website. And one of the other administrators um, responded with, well, in order to fix a, a, a problem on the front page of the Cassandra site, you need to subscribe to this mailing list, and then you need to send them a, a patch, and, and they'll apply to that patch. So here's how you subscribe to the mailing list, and here's how you post to it. And the guy was like, that's way too much trouble. Just, just fix your typo. Can you do that? It'll take you five seconds. It'll take me all day. And so that was a, a clear example of putting roadblocks in, in someone's way rather than saying, you know, thanks for the contribution, and if you want to get more involved, here's these other things that you can do. Um, I am frequently heard to say that you should give out commit rights like candy. Our open source projects are in revision control, all of them. If they're not, you're doing something wrong, but you already know that. You know, 20 years ago, not everybody used revision control. Now everyone does. And the purpose of revision control is largely, if somebody makes a mistake, it's easy to fix. So there is no risk in giving somebody commit rights. Um, the, the, risk, the risk of giving somebody commit rights too early is that they'll make a mistake, right? The risk of giving them commit rights too late is that they'll go away and never come back, which it, to me is clearly the larger, the larger risk. And so I, I always um, encourage projects to give away commit rights as though there was no cost, because there's no cost. If somebody's passionate, give them commit rights and let them play along. Um, you know, make sure you have a rollback plan, but you do because you're using revision control. Now, often when I say this, I get a couple of objections, people saying, we can't give out commit rights because. And these may be legitimate concerns, but uh, I, I think that they are all fixable. So the, the first one is they're not trusted yet. And um, I have encountered in my years of open source, people I can count on one hand who legitimate, gave me legitimate reasons for not trusting their contributions to a project, people that were actively malicious, people that were committing out of ill will. And it, it's incredibly uncommon for somebody to come to com contribute to your project and be fundamentally untrustworthy. Um, on, on the other side of this, the best way to make someone trustworthy is to trust them. If you give trust to somebody, they will, generally speaking, reciprocate. Withholding trust, being suspicious, communicating that you're suspicious, is a great way to tell somebody that they're not welcome and to make them feel like they're, they're not ever going to be a full member of your, of your little club. And the other risk, you know, I already mentioned, is that they might break something. And that's why we have revision control, that's why we have CI, that's why we have uh, a review, a code review process. If your project lacks any of those things that I just mentioned, then fix that rather than trying to chase people away. Now, there, there are legitimate cases where you don't want to hand out commit rights um, if you're running the infrastructure that supports your organization. You don't want to give root to everybody that, that comes up and offers to help. Um, there are things that are, in fact, very expensive to break. Um, if somebody screws up your backups or takes down your mail server or does anything to any of your production services, um, then perhaps you need a development and test server to run this stuff on. And that is a situation where it's legitimately a good thing to, to uh, hold back on what rights you give. Um, but if it's code, you know, maybe give them a branch or actually have a CI process. Within the Apache Software Foundation, we have these terms, uh, review then commit, or commit then review. Uh, in modern software development, review then commit is becoming more and more common, where your, your patches have to go through a review and CI process before they'll ever hit the source tree. Uh, for the last five years, I've been working on the OpenStack project. 
and every time you submit a patch to OpenStack, it spins up thousands of virtual machines to test this thing, and it runs it through all the, I mean, even when you're changing the documentation, it goes through the entire test suite. And, and that, that's a way, when you have code that is truly sensitive and complex, um, that's a way that things can be thoroughly tested before they're ever committed. Um, the, the commit then review model makes sense for things that aren't quite as sensitive. Uh, perhaps you don't really need a full review cycle on documentation changes. Um, perhaps you don't need a full review cycle when you're updating the, the test infrastructure. But uh, it's, it's a good thing to have. It's a good thing to have these sort of commit hooks that, that put everything through, the, uh, through their paces before it gets committed. It's a little bit of a sidetrack from my main topic. Um, getting back to it, social permission is often a lot harder to give than technical permission because, you know, we're, we've been working on this code and these are the newcomers and they don't know anything and they don't have our experience and they're, they, we, we tend to hold on very tightly to the things that we hold dear. Um, but giving this permission is a critical step uh, in, in welcoming new members this social permission that says, you are allowed to do this. So one of the first ways that you can do this is give people time. Um, when you see a bug, don't fix it right away. If it's not critical, if it is not breaking the world, give somebody else a chance to fix this. Go out of your way to document this problem, maybe even a suggestion of how to fix it. This is going to take more time than just fixing it a lot of the time, and that's why a lot of people don't do this. But remember that you are investing in the future of your project, and so it is worthwhile taking that time to encourage someone else to fix that problem, because the next time around, they're going to fix it and you won't have to, and you'll have saved that much time. So think long-term rather than short-term, and give people the time to fix a problem, even though you already know the right way to do it. Give them a chance to try and fail. Uh, give them gentle encouragement towards a good solution. Now, when, when tasks get done really quickly, it can be very discouraging to, to beginners. And, and I found over the last 10 years or so that this is amplified by increased corporate involvement in open source. Um, and, and I've noticed this even more at, at Red Hat, where you, have, where you have projects that have a, an overwhelming number of the contributors are from Red Hat, and they're working 40 hours a week on it. And then you have the folks that are working on their weekend. So Sunday afternoon, they look at the code, they identify a problem, they work on it for an hour, and then you know, they go to their real job on Monday. Friday evening, they come back, um, that problem has already been uh, fixed by someone else in a different way and committed, and all of their work was wasted, and they have wasted their weekend, and their wife's mad at them, and their kids are, are irritated that they didn't take them to the park, and the next weekend, I'm not going to spend my time doing that. And so uh, you, you have the, the big corporate monster chasing, uh, crushing the, the hobbyist. And this is not an easy problem to solve. If you have a, a solution to this, I want to hear about it because it, it's a problem that I face every day in my day job um, where the hobbyist contributor is actively discouraged. Not because people are being unkind, people are doing a good job, they're doing the job that they're paid to do, but that contributor is made to feel useless. So. This is a hard problem. Um, the next thing that I would ask you to do is explicitly ask people to do things. Um, and, and this goes with code. It also goes with, um, you know, I, I run a number of small events and I'll throw a call for papers out on the mailing list and nothing happens. But if you approach an individual and say, I've been watching the work that you're doing in this project, I would like a talk from you on this topic you'll have an abstract within a half an hour. Um, asking people is much, asking people personally, individually to do specific things 
Um, it, it does a number of different things. One is it, it lets them know that they're allowed. So this goes back to the giving permission. 90% um, of the time when I ask somebody directly to submit a talk for a conference, their first response is, I really don't have anything to say and I, don't, I feel stupid up on stage. And the, you know, if, if, you, if you walk them through this and show them that in fact what they're doing is really cool and everybody wants to know about it, that gives them permission. And you know, we think, I said it on the mailing list, of course they know that they have permission, but that's not always the case. Um, the second thing that it does is uh, a slightly nuanced difference. It lets them know that you believe that they can do it. I am standing here today on this stage because someone told me that I could give a conference presentation. And my response was, I have nothing to say and I would feel stupid up on stage. And he said, you've been doing these things and I want you to come to my event and talk about them. That was 18 years ago and I speak at a dozen conferences every year and, and it's because of that one moment. And it, it, it told me that Ken believed that I could do it, even though, you know, he probably didn't and he was just being nice, but I did it, right? Um, another nuance on that is it lets them know that they are trusted. It lets them know that the community trusts them. It lets them know that uh, what they're going to produce is going to be accepted and trusted as good enough. Um, telling somebody that they're trusted makes them trust themselves more. <clears throat> now, here's another nuance on the same concept. Um, this is kind of playing the guilt card a little bit. It lets them know that the community's counting on them and if they don't step up, something's gonna break. Now, different ones of these work better with different people, but uh, this, uh, this tells them that you know, maybe they need to step out of what they've been doing and, and actually doing something that they're not terribly comfortable with because the community is counting on them and it's not going to get done otherwise. And then the, the last thing in this particular train of thought is that it shows them what they should do the next time. And this, this is really rewarding for me as a mentor where I will say to somebody, I need you to step up and do this thing and then a year later, I see them doing that same thing to another junior developer saying, you, you should step up and do this thing. And, and knowing myself that that person could do a better job, they're handing it off to their junior in order to, to model what we've done. And so it, it's extremely rewarding to watch this. Now, um, th this is, is Ken. I mentioned Ken earlier. Uh, Ken Core is one of my oldest friends. Um, in 1999, he said, you need to submit a conference paper to uh, this new event that we're doing called ApacheCon. And I did that. And uh, ApacheCon has become, in, in many ways, my life work. I've been, I've been producing ApacheCon for 18 years now because Ken asked me to, to submit this paper that I knew that I had nothing to speak about. Um, this is, is my wall in my office. These are conferences that I've spoken at. And, and I'm not saying this to say, look at me, I'm wonderful. I'm, I'm saying this to say, um, Ken invested his time in me so that I can, can be here investing my time in other people. Um, here's, here's another individual. He's actually sitting in the back of the room here. Um, in 1998, I was complaining about the documentation of an open source project called the Apache Web Server. And he said, well, then go fix it. And I thought, huh, I never thought of that. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll go do that. Um, over the course of the next 15 years, I and a half dozen other people completely rewrote all of the documentation and we're darn proud of it. We think that it is amazing documentation. Um, I wrote these books. Um, and I, uh, I, I owe this to a moment where Jim said, go fix it yourself. Here's the, here's the commit bit. Um, just, just go do it. This is Sally Kuderi. Um, she is the marketing director of the Apache Software Foundation. A little over 10 years ago, 
she said, you should run for the board of directors of the Apache Software Foundation. And I said, there is no way I'm going to do that. That's so far out of what I'm comfortable doing. Um, uh, I'm now serving on my fifth term, I think, on the board. It took me a few years to get around to it, but uh, I did eventually run for the board and, and was, was elected. Now, once again, I'm, I'm not trying to say these things to say, look at me, look how wonderful I am. What I'm saying is that you have the opportunity to unlock potential in people who think they don't have any. And you have the opportunity uh, to, to change someone's life by encouraging them to do things. Uh, mentoring is really, truly a path to immortality. You are, you are creating the future by encouraging somebody to do something that, that they didn't think they could do. Uh, my wife is uh, she's a, a silversmith, among other things. She is a, a very talented artist. And this is a, a poster that's on her wall. Um, Pablo Picasso said, I'm always doing the things I can't do in order to be able to do them. And so, you know, my wife has taken this to heart and whenever she feels that she's pretty good at a particular medium in art, she abandons it and starts something else. And so she has all of these different, uh, all of these different arts that, she has, that she's mastered by just going and doing them. So she made all the, the rings that I'm wearing, by the way. If you want to buy them, I can give you her business card. But all that to say, um, encouraging people into things that they're not comfortable with will very much change their lives. Uh, there's, there's a video linked down here. I'll give you the, the link to my slides later. Um, Casey Neistat is a uh, YouTube movie maker, and he has this wonderful short film called Do What You Can't about doing the things that people tell you you can't do. People say, there's, there's no way you're going to succeed at that, and that is the thing that you should grasp and, and try to do. So, all right. Back to asking people how to do things. There's a, a, couple, a couple ways that you should ask. One is to be very specific. Don't tell people, come help me on my project, because they will be overwhelmed and they'll come look at your project and they, will, uh, they'll not, they won't know where to start. Um, tell people, I want you to work on this task. Be as specific as possible. Um, in, in one regard, this is, what, this is what your ticketing system is about. But if you have a thousand open tickets in your ticket system, it's extremely overwhelming. Um, giving people a, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the, the thing later about specifying what are good starter tickets, but that's, uh, that's one thing you can do. Um, a, another thing that you can do is encourage people to answer questions. This is, uh, this is my primary way of mentoring over the last 10 years is via IRC. I, I find people that are, that are clearly asking good questions and maybe answering some of them. And when someone asks a frequently asked question, I don't answer it. I say, uh, why don't you ask this person who has demonstrated some, some knowledge and they'll answer that. And then gradually they, they build their confidence. Um, I've heard this referred to as micro-mentoring. Um, it takes 30 seconds to do, and it has a lasting impact on somebody's sense of, of their own abilities. Another way to ask is to set specific expectations. Um, you need to not just let people uh, stomp all over your code. You have code standards. You have uh, style standards. You want to make sure that those are met, tell people when you are asking them to do something, tell them this is due on Tuesday and you need to meet our style guidelines. Now, this has a number of side effects. It's not just, it's not just uh, making it harder for them. In fact, it's making, them, making it easier for them. It shows them exactly what standard they have to rise to. It lets them know when they're done. And also, if you say it's due on Tuesday, then you should check in with them on Sunday and say, how's it going? Because if they're not making any progress, maybe you need to um, give them more time or give the task to somebody else. 
Another thing that you need to do when you ask is to offer to help. Make sure you explicitly say, I can help you in these ways.、Um, don't do it for them. Don't help them so much that they're not doing it themselves, but make it clear that they have a safety net. Make it clear that if they can't get it done by Tuesday, the world's not going to fall apart. But、uh, that, that's your expectation.、Um, never, ever be condescending. Assume competence、um, and, and, and only offer help when it's needed. Don't jump in and help somebody just because they're. They're not doing it to your standards or as fast as you would have thought because that communicates a lack of trust. And then when they're done, make sure you give them credit. Don't take the credit for yourself. Even if you did 75% of the work, give them the credit and praise them publicly. And that goes a long way towards making people feel ownership of the code.、Uh, several of the projects that I've been involved with over the last few years. List every single contributor to a new release. OpenStack listed 1,925 contributors to the latest release by name on the, in the release notes. And、uh, my name's on there, and I feel really good about that.、Um, the world doesn't have to know that I changed two lines of documentation, but my name is in the release notes, and that's really cool.、Um, WordPress does this too.、Uh, I, it's it's a A habit I think we should all get into. And once again, even if you helped, make sure that they get the credit for their change.、Um, even if you commit their patch for them, make sure that you put their name in the commit message. Now, when you're asking, it's a good idea to have a list of things to ask them to do. And you do this by identifying good starter tasks,、uh, tasks that are good for a beginner.、Um, Often people will tag these in their ticket systems as easy fix or good first bug or beginner, so that somebody can look at your ticket system and immediately pick out something that won't take them three weeks, that they have a chance of doing, and will help them learn more about the code base. Here's an example of this from the,、uh, from the WordPress ticket tracker. And what I want you to notice on this is how much work this person went into、uh, to. Document a problem that could literally, they could have fixed in a minute and a half. They took a screenshot, they put a call out arrow on it, and they described the problem in detail. And that is so that a beginner can come and fix this and learn more about the plugin system and go away with a feeling of accomplishment, even though this individual knows the code inside and out and could have fixed it in no time.、Um, this is the,、uh, the Easy fix queue in,、uh, in OpenStack. And it's a list of, of bugs that,、uh, that are exhaustively documented, step by step, how to reproduce the problem and how to fix it. And、uh, uh, you know, Chandan is another guy that, that knows the code inside and out. He could have done this in less time than it took him to write this up. But because he wrote this up, we have two new contributors on the project. So, this is, this is a big win.、Uh, here's a, a couple websites. Again, I'll, I'll give you my, my、uh, slide URL at the end. These are some websites that, that, are,、uh, that I've used in the examples. Now, you may think that contributing to your project is, is intuitive. It's not. Nobody knows how to do it. Every project is different, has uh, unique uh, quirks and irritations. And You need to document that process and then watch somebody go through your documentation. And every time they pull their hair out, make sure that you clarify that point that was irritating.、Um, I, uh, I did a, a podcast interview yesterday with some people from the、um, opensourcediversity.org project. And the, the front and center on their website is this article called Your First Pull Request. And it walks you through step by step your first pull request because. You know, if you've been doing it for a few years, it seems obvious, but it's not.、Um, I, I'm close to running out of time. I want to talk about one more thing, which is who you should mentor. Once again, if you mentor Alexander the Great and he destroys the world, that's on you. So be careful.、Um, 
One category of people that I recommend mentoring is the ones who ask good questions, the, the, the irritating questions that make you actually go back and think, why on earth did we do it that way? These are the people that are going to take your product into your project in the next step because uh, they're asking these deep questions that you've stopped thinking about. Um, and, and documentation is, is a great way, a great place for this. People say, why did you describe it that way? And your answer is not, because that's how it works. Your answer is, um, help me understand how you would have understood that better. Um, the people that are, that are especially irritating and always argue about things um, tell you that, that the way you've done it is really stupid. These are good people to mentor as well. Push down your irritation, push down your, your sense of wounded pride, and, and mentor those people. Um, also recognize that your mailing list is not the only place where conversations happen, and watching conversations other places is a great way to identify people that you should be mentoring and bring into the community. We have two people on the Apache Web Server Documentation IRC channel that, that we brought over from Stack Overflow because they were answering questions brilliantly there, and we're trying to bring them into the documentation project. Um, people that contribute a lot to peripheral things, plugins, modules, etc., are often good people to mentor because they understand an aspect of your product that, that you may not. Um, everyone else, uh, you know, we have limited time. We have very limited time who we can choose to mentor. Um, but there are some people that I would encourage you to avoid. Um, I hate the word mentees. Uh, it always makes me think of, of the uh, aquatic mammal manatee. But uh, some people are looking for something to put on their resume, and that's the only reason that they're participating. And these people are often hard to identify, but once you identify them, you may not want to invest your life in them. Um, some people are trying to achieve the fame and adulation that I have standing up here on stage. You know, everybody loves me, right? So they, <laughs> they want to skip that process and jump to the end. And, and it, it's hard work, and you, you might not want to invest your life in those people. Another thing that we find a lot on, uh, on support channels is people that are asking you to do their homework. And these are often easy to to spot because they ask their question in a way that clearly comes from a take-home exam. And uh, this is probably not somebody that you want to invest a great deal of time into. So to conclude, um, the, the best way to amplify yourself is by mentoring other people to follow after you. And so you, you want to clone your effort. Now, I've chosen this picture here intentionally and ironically because, as, as you can obviously tell, it's a bunch of white men. And I, I want to especially encourage us, those of us in the audience who are white men, not to simply clone ourselves. Identify people that think differently from yourself and invest your life in them because they will, in turn, make you a better person. Um, if, if you just go looking for people that are just like you, then your community will always be just like you, and you won't ever have any new ideas. So I, I use the term cloning here extremely ironically. Do not clone yourself. Expand your pool of ideas, or you'll just be a stagnant pond. Mentoring is a way to influence the future. It's a way to extend your impact years beyond your life, and uh, you know none of us are getting any younger. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I hope I've left enough time for questions, if there are any. These are ways to get in touch with me. All of my slides are at boxofclue.com. Um, thank you. Yeah. Please thank for Rich. Uh, we don't really have much time Sorry. for questions, <laughs> unless like very quick one. Um, otherwise, after the coffee break, we'll have um, extra time. Uh, so, is there a quick question? Okay. For the quick one. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rich. Um, just had a question about you asked uh, about what were some of the ways that you could 
have a better balance in contributing time between work and yeah. uh, home and, and uh, your personal time. And, and uh, one of the things I just wanted to share with you is that uh, as an engineering manager, uh, one of the things I have tried to do is in order to encourage everybody on the team, uh, every engineer on the team to contribute to uh, actually factor in 20% time mm -hmm. on work time to be able to work on you know their projects or uh, areas that they're contributing yeah. to an open source. And that seems to work quite well. So it's about one, one day a week. And I know that sounds you know like a lot of time, but it is actually very uh, rewarding because that circles back around into everybody being to, a, able to contribute to other aspects of their feature yeah. development too. Yeah, that's a, that's so, a good point. And so hopefully that you know, adds back to you. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a manager and you have that opportunity, yes. do that. <laughs> anyway, that, that was just, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Alalita. Thank you very much. Thank you all again.